Assalamu alaikum alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. People have asked, many people have asked, how is it that I, I came to Islam? And probably after so many years of being asked this question and having the opportunity to, to think uh, somewhat deeply about it, I think for me, I, I really never, in, in one sense, I never became a Muslim in the traditional sense. That is, uh, I became a Muslim through uh, a, a series of, of processes uh, that, that I think were, were very orchestrated and very organized, even though while I was living it, it didn't, it didn't really seem like that. And ultimately, I never left what I had, but that I acquired a, a fuller vision of what it is that I already believed in. It replaced some issues of doubt with issues of certainty. Probably I, I could go back to my earliest recollections and say, SubhanAllah, I grew up in New York City, uh, born in Brooklyn. My father is from the Caribbean, Barbados. My mother is from Louisiana, the northern part, not the part that's uh, Mardi Gras and Cajun and all that. But they met in New York City and were married and went to Howard University uh, where my father and my mother studied. Those variables, I think, for me are, are important because it created for me an international sense that I was born uh, to this sort of eclectic international kind of family. So I had national American roots and I had Caribbean roots. And then I was born right after my parents graduated from College University. My father went to pharmacy and my mother in dental hygiene. I think really probably subhanAllah, uh, if it were not for the fact that they needed to match the times, my mother probably uh, should have done dentistry, subhanAllah. Uh, she was such a, a wonderful student. I heard about that, I didn't know about that. But when I, uh, when my mother graduated from Howard University, that was in June, I was born in August of that year, and they had moved back to New York City. So I was born in New York, even though I was conceived at Howard University. You might ask the question, why is this relevant? But subhanAllah, if you stay with us, you, you, you'll see it. I grew up in Brooklyn, and soon after, uh, maybe I was three or four years old, uh, my mother and father separated. And so I was raised by my mother. My mother had, a, had an, an interesting uh, kind of very outgoing, engaging personality. Uh, we lived in one of those buildings you call a, a brownstone. It's one of those houses like you see maybe on the Cosby show uh, where you know, people live on top of one another. And in the old days, uh, when families were large, it used to just be one family lived in the whole building. Mother father, grandparents, grandchildren. Uh, but in the later years, it became uh, what they call rooming houses, where people would rent out uh, the upper levels, and they would live on, on in part of the building. Well, my mother, in order to uh, supplement her income, uh, she would uh, rent out the upper part of the building, and we closed off access from the top to bottom for our part of the house. But subhanAllah, right around this time, I was born in August of 1956, the 19th of August, subhanAllah. In the 60s, I was obviously five years old in 1960, 61, right around the time that John F. Kennedy became president and during the period of what we call the Cold War. The Cold War, Dr. Suleiman Yang gave me this insight, uh, Prof. 
professor at Howard University in African Studies, former chairman, said the United States began to bring Muslims to America in significant numbers as what he called the children of the Cold War. So in order to vie between Africa and the Middle East and Asia for their intelligentsia, the United States would build a relationship with governments and say, give us your talented people and bring them to America and we will train them how to become leaders of their society. Now, subhanAllah, the Soviets were doing the same thing, and we'll get to that later. So for me, in the 60s, civil rights movement is going on, other things are going on, and international students are renting space above where I live from my mother. And so when I got to be the age of seven or eight years old, I can remember some of these international students. They were my first babysitters. And when they came to America, uh, they had some folklore that says, you know, whatever place that you, family that you stay with when you first arrive, this is your family in America. And so these men, young men, they would look to my mother as their mother in America, and therefore I was like their baby brother in America. Well, I can remember one of them, subhanAllah, my mother used to always call him by his full name, Sammy Abdul Wahab. Sammy Abdul Wahab. He was from uh, Liberia. He was Muslim. But we never talked about Islam. Uh, I would visit his uh, room, and I recall that uh, he didn't have much furniture. He, his bed was on the floor, and... Uh, we would eat on the floor and he would have a big bowl or a big pan in front of him and he would put some rice and he had some kind of sauce and meat and he'd put it there and I asked him one time I said uh, Sammy what kind of meat is this is this pork <laughs> he said subhanallah no this is this is lamb no Americans especially regular people in those days they didn't eat lamb so it was a chunky kind of meat, and, uh, lighter than beef. Uh, most of the time, I said, well, I don't know. And I would eat with him, and, uh, and maybe I would eat with both hands. And he would say, no, 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 eat with your right hand. I didn't know that I was being influenced by someone who was teaching me the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But these were men that I look up to. I'm, I'm sure in my memory now I can see something that looked like a prayer rug in his room. I never saw him pray. We never talked about the Quran. Well, I had another uh, babysitter, subhanAllah, from Nigeria. His nickname, Mobilaji. What we didn't know then is that Mobilaji is in his local language the name Muhammad. SubhanAllah. Mubalaji was someone who uh, my mother took him in like a son again. And so we had these experiences and political discussions about the world and this and that. So I came to a, a sense of, of being, having been mentored by men who had Islamic backgrounds. Now my, my mother never asked them, what is your religion, what's your background? But subhanAllah, from those early seeds of Islam, not, the, not people talking about Islam, but people giving the perspective that comes from the background of being Muslim. Probably as a young person, I was, I, I think, fairly uh, spiritual. Uh, I used to attend my mother, the Anglican Church. Now, even though my mother uh, grew up in the South, eh, we didn't have Anglican Church in Louisiana. But when my mother married my father, the Church of England is the 
the church of the island of Barbados because of the British connection. But the Anglican Church in America was formed when the United States was formed, breaking away from the British. They could no longer have in those areas where uh, the Church of England had its allegiance to the crown. And so they had to either decide whether they leave the principles of the Anglican Church completely or whether they would form a new church with the same or similar doctrine, but they would excise the, the queen and king as the head of the church. And so they created the American Episcopal Church. So I grew up in the Episcopal Church, uh, St. Luke and St. Matthews on Clinton Avenue and Fulton Street in Brooklyn, New York. I sang in the choir. I was regular in church. And you know, when you're a kid and you sing in the choir, uh, you have to stay awake during the services. <laughs> Where maybe other kids, they could sleep because we sat right behind the priest. We had to be awake and attentive, and we would stand and sit to, to sing, and we would process in and out. So I spent a lot of time in church. Not only that, uh, we had choir rehearsals. And so I would attend uh, choir rehearsals some days during the week. And they had one rehearsal for the kids just to teach you how to sing. And then they had another rehearsal where you would sing with the whole choir. So that was a couple of days a week right there. So in my life, the activities in the church, my mother was head of the youth group. We, we were very active. But subhanAllah, when... I would visit my relatives in the Deep South. Uh, they had a different kind of religious experience. Uh, their religion wasn't the uh, two days a week that you go to choir rehearsal plus Sunday at 11 o'clock. They had a kind of organic faith. It permeated, if they were saved and sanctified, they were uh, what uh, people call here kojic. Church of God in Christ. Um, they were uh, Christian fundamentals. They believed that the television uh, was was haram. That, they, that was people shouldn't watch television. If they did, uh, they watched it for special things. The news or the president had a, some, something like that. Uh, but just to sit and watch uh, television uh, for them uh, that that was that was a sin. Uh, they didn't go to the movies. Um, they didn't go to outdoor athletic events because there was beer and, and wine and so on. Uh, and so in the summer, because my mother was a single parent and she had to work during the summer, she didn't have a, a, a vac uh, to, to be off all summer, uh, she had to have something to do with, with me, so she would send me to visit my relatives uh, in the South. And, you know, the family is a, is a tremendous thing. For a time, my grandparents watched me when I was, my mother and father were first breaking up. So the family in the South, they knew me as this little guy who used to live with them for uh, a few months. And so my grandmother really thought of me almost like one of her own children, not really like a, a grandchild. So I would visit them in the South in the summers, and I would go to the Koji Church, and I would uh, see that uh, they were very serious about their religion and they kind of looked down on uh, New Yorkers like me who had a sort of a, you know, vacation religion. You know, they just, on the weekend they would have religion the rest of the week or maybe just part of the day on Sunday and the rest of the time uh, they drank and they had, they partied and whatever. Uh, these people didn't do anything. We went to church, subhanAllah, Monday night, Tuesday night, Wednesday night, I think Thursday night they took off. <laughs> Friday, so every, almost every day we were in church. And they wanted to live the gospel of Jesus. SubhanAllah. Uh, it put me in an environment where those values and principles of worship, of faithfulness, uh, were exemplified as a daily way of life. When I would go back to New York City, I would go back to um, the 
other sort of more formal, very little uh, everyday worship activities, but a uh, life of service. And my mother uh, was a servant of her community. That she was always helping out and always looking out for the children and the needy people in the neighborhood. And so if you put those things together, it, it lays a found, it creates a foundation and a culture that Islam is a fertile ground. When I was about, I guess, 12 or 13, they have something in the uh, Episcopal Church called Confirmation. SubhanAllah, at Confirmation, you have to learn the creed of the faith, and you move from baptism, where as an infant they sprinkle water on you, and godparents take the pledge that of the faith for you and then when you reach the age of puberty then you assume that responsibility for yourself and so I had to attend confirmation class so by the way I enjoyed confirmation class and I would come in through the back door and go through the choir room and come through the area where the altars were and I would come to my confirmation with other little kids like myself, I guess, you know. Not not elementary, but not in the upper uh, grades. And we mostly, we wanted to go out and play after school. We didn't really want to go to confirmation class, but subhanAllah, I used to go to confirmation class. And I had to learn, and I learned. And one of the things that helped, I think, uh, as a a dividing line, a place that made me think about what alhamdulillah, my faith. And that was that, and I think it was a turning, a really a, a, a place when I can look back and see a turning point. Confirmation class, you have to learn the Ten Commandments. And subhanAllah, the priest, he had us in the room, and I remember he said, who knows the first commandment? I raised my hand. So I'm very enthusiastic. So he said, tell me. I said, uh, uh, thou shalt have no other gods before me. And another citation, it says, uh, O children of Israel, your God is a jealous God and refuses to have any one worship besides him. Oh, very good, very good. I raised my hand again. <laughs> the priest, he asked, Yes, what is it? He said, I have a question. I said, Father, it, it says that there's only one God. Why do we have three? Father, Son, Holy Ghost. He said, oh, oh no, it's only one God. Uh, but, the, but it's one God. It's, it's, it's one God that's made up of three. So it's, it says one, and you say it's three. I don't understand. He said, this is a matter of faith. This is our faith, and you have to accept it. How these are manifestation of God. Is but it didn't work for me at 12 years old, 13. I, I wasn't buying it, but I'm the lie. Next, who knows the second commandment? I'm going again. <laughs> SubhanAllah. I guess maybe, I don't know, he called on me because I guess maybe nobody else was, nobody else wanted to raise their hand, so he asked me. I said, okay. I said, thou shalt not make to thyself any graven image of a likeness of anything that is in the earth or on the earth or in the water or under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down to them nor worship them. Good answer. <laughs> Have a follow-up. I said, Father, I don't understand. We, we say, we say, thou shalt not make to thyself any graven images. I said, but Father, when I come into the church and I go through the, 
the place and from the big altars and the small altars and everything and the stained glass windows there are pictures of, of God and there's pictures of Jesus who's supposed to be God too and there's statues of Jesus on the cross and when I go by the altars uh, I have to stop and worship each one of them before I can go by to stop going next he said oh we're not worshiping you he said, we're using these images to help us focus our worship to God. So, we're not worshiping the images. I said, okay, Father. I said, we may not be worshiping the images. We're worshiping what they represent. I said, but it says, thou shalt not bow down nor worship. Now, I may not be worshiping the thing itself. But I'm definitely bowing down. I don't understand. Woo! The priest, he turned red. <laughs> it's interesting. It's mostly a black community. Most of all the kids in confirmation were black, as far as I can remember. And the priest is white. Because we lived in a community of white flight. So in the 60s, a lot of people moved out from whites, moved out from the inner city. And so I have a priest who was saying to me, you really don't get it, kid, that I just told you that we're not worshiping it. I said, well, Father, it says, thou shalt not bow down nor worship. And I know definitely when I pass by the altar that I am bowing down. I don't know what he said after that. I just remember he was very unhappy with yours truly. And we moved on to the other commandments. But for me, after that day, I began listening to the sermon and the reading of the Bible with, I think, a different ear. That I could hear in the Easter service when the Bible says that Jesus cried out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? I said, I'm, I think I'm on to something. I started to think in the way that when they report that Jesus, peace be upon him, uh, would sit with the learned people and that he would have a new and a different interpretation of the scriptures than they had. I began feeling that precocious feeling as a young person that God is guiding me and the interpretation that I have I think is more accurate to the meaning of the Bible than the way that my priest is instructing me. You know, it's funny, a person goes to seminary and studies and he can't convince a 13-year-old that what he's saying is true and his interpretation is true and that what that young person is reading in the book that they don't understand it. I went for what does the book say and began placing the rest of that information in that context. Well, by the time I was a high school student my mother and I had traveled uh, to many different countries. I had seen many different people and been in many different ways of life. And we were always hosting uh, guests who were coming from other countries and other cultures. So my worldview as a little black boy in the middle of Brooklyn it was a very wide worldview. So when I got to high school, I started to study about different world religions, about Buddhism, about uh, Hinduism. Uh, as a musician in high school, I used to go to the ashram because some of the, the musicians at that time had started looking into Eastern religion. The Beatles had, uh, were going to the Dalai Lama. And, uh, John McLaughlin had become, uh, I think, a, a Hindu. So 
in in that those spirit and I think Carlos Santana too. That many of them became interested in these Eastern religions, John Coltrane and others, although they had had some association with Islam. And then let's not forget, subhanAllah, when I used to ride up to Harlem with my father to his pharmacy, I would see on the subway members of the Nation of Islam. And I would ask my father, what kind of people are these? He said, oh, these are people that in the, they're part of this group called Nation of Islam. He said most of them uh, came out of prison or from the South. They're not well educated. And of course, very proud of us. And he said, you know, uh, we don't need that. <laughs> that kind of religion, we don't need it, but it's good for them. So he didn't put it down, but he said that, that we, the kind of people that we are, we don't need it. SubhanAllah. With that foundation, I went to college at Howard University. And when I got to university, I met and studied with and became friends with people from all around the world, from Africa, from Asia, from the Middle East. And the people who became my closest friends were Muslims. I, thinking that I'm just following in the natural way of growing and developing, I became a vegetarian and, and learned that some of the foods that we were eating were not they weren't the foods that the Bible was saying to eat. Uh, the book of Leviticus tells you not to eat pork. Uh, uh, and drugs and alcohol and the consciousness that comes from, subhanAllah, from Malcolm X and people like this talking about how we need to be upright and to be serving our community. And all of this fell on the foundation of my family. Well, alhamdulillah, as a learned person studying in university, uh, I stopped doing the things that people uh, around me were doing and I started doing the things that the Muslims around me were doing until ultimately one day I met two drunk men uh, on the corner and when they saw me coming they put the, the man he put his wine bottle behind his back we used to call them wine holders back then now they call them alcoholic homeless people well, when they saw me coming, one of the, the, the brothers, he said to me, he said, Brother, can I ask you a question, Brother? I'm trying to, trying to educate this guy right here. He said, Brother, how many gods are there, Brother? <laughs> I said, well, Brother, there's only, there's only one God. He says, yeah, I'm talking about Brother Muslim. He said, Brother, you, 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 you believe in Allah, right? I said, well, Allah is just the word for, for God. He says, I'm talking about Brother Muslim. He said, Brother, you believe in Muhammad, right, Brother? I said, well, of course, Muhammad. I mean, any knowledgeable person know Muhammad is a prophet. He said, that's what I'm talking about. I said, Brother, that's Muslim. I said, brother you, he said, brother, you don't eat that pork, do you, Brother? I said, no, sir, I don't eat pork, Brother. It's nasty. It's not good. He said, Muslim. That's what I'm trying to tell you, Brother, not Muslim. Right? And he went down this whole catechism. It was just like I was in confirmation all over again. And subhanAllah. Uh, when I finished with him, I said, well, brother, I'm, I'm not a Muslim. He said, that's all right, brother. Allah, assalamu alaikum. I said, oh, alaikum, salam. <laughs> and what I had not fully come to realize is that through a step-by-step -step process that I had become Muslim. I didn't change to become something else. That from those foundations, I had become the product of the understanding that had grown out of many decades. I was a graduate student. I had done a degree in chemistry and was working on my master's degree in genetics. The evidence of Allah's reality and the truth was evident everywhere. It was just finally me making the commitment one day of Brother Shamsuddin. He came to me and said, I see you praying with us. Muslims. I see you fasting. When did you take Shahada? And I said, well, uh, I never did that. He said, well, you need to do that because that's when you make the commitment to live by these principles. And so one day at college, it was at Juma, I went to the Islamic Center in Washington, D.C. And I sat with some of the 
the best decision, subhanAllah, have been my life. May Allah accept it, inshallah. Forgive me of my sins.